Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study, and we're going to continue in Daniel chapter 11 and see where we go today. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all the things you do in our lives, and we are thankful, Lord, for the light that you've been giving us as we spend time gleaning the field of truth and as we look at Daniel chapter 11, especially as we try to understand its application for the present. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can bring a power and conviction into our lives and that you can guide and direct us in our day-to-day decisions, that you can give us strength to obey your word. And we ask for forgiveness for our sins. Help us to reflect Christ's character in all that we do. We pray for those searching for truth. And we ask, Lord, that we can uh, present it clearly and live it in our lives. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, not as many people here today. I don't know if people are getting tired with this topic. Because <laughs> we keep going over a lot of the same things. But, you know, as I said in my prayer, we're gleaning the field. And, you know, obviously it's a lot more enjoyable when you go into a field and you have a huge harvest of grain and, and your your bins are filling up and, um, you know, it just, you know, everybody likes that part. But to go through back through the fields and glean has its own rewards. And that is sometimes you find precious seed that's been missed. And, and these things, when, you know, we're kind of mixing metaphors, but if you look at it like jewels, uh, some of these pres- precious jewels end up being very significant. So there's a couple of things we have to look at. Um, there was, well, Dwight had a thought, a couple of them, and, and it had to do with looking at the he and the them, and or the they and the him, in um, Daniel chapter 11, verse, which verse was it? This was going back to... Wasn't this about verse 25 and 26? Yeah, 25 and 26. There we are. I'm just trying to find the verses. Okay. <clears throat> so, and he shall stir up his power and courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up uh, to battle. And I need to share my screen. That's what I'm not doing. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. And, and that's where we're saying who is the ones uh, forecasting the devices. That is the they, and who is the him? And you have the idea, what if the them or the they is Octavian and Marcus Agrippa, and the him is Anthony, correct? Correct. Okay. And, and that's possible that we could have, um, that could be the case, because that was really what I was trying to figure out, was why is there a they there? Now, I would say the forecasting that the device is against him must be against Antony, that is, against the king of the south. But um, in this, in the same situation, if Antony is trying to forecast his devices against Octavian and Agrippa, is that also not possible? Yeah, but that doesn't really make sense, just because of of what actually ends up happening. And especially when we're looking at the forecasting of devices, this appears to be the machinations of Rome and particularly the king of the north as a symbol, because he's going to forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And it's going to be beginning with the forecasting of devices against the king of the south, the Battle of Actium, right? So it doesn't make sense to have the forecast of the devices be Antony forecasting his devices. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. In verse 24, right, we have, he's going to forecast his devices against or from the strongholds even for a time. That marks the period of 360 years. And one of the places we started is the Battle of Actium, which is then going to be described. Right. So it's going to describe the Battle of Actium. And for they shall forecast his devices against him. I think if we put Agrippa in there, the one who's commanding the fleet, because this is primarily a 
uh, maritime, maritime battle, then that would make sense, right? So in our, in our notes, uh, I think that's, that's a good answer to that question because we, we didn't have the answer to that. We, we, we had left that un, unresolved in our uh, document. Now, I think it's also kind of worth noting that Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa was Octavian's brother-in-law. And even though he was of one of the upper echelon Roman families, for a while he took a lower echelon position and became one of the Romans that would improve the streets and the buildings. And history notes that he was the one that was responsible for the building of the original Parthenon. The Parthenon? Pantheon, sorry. Okay, the Pantheon. Okay. So so explain that again. So who built? Uh, what's the relationship? Okay. The military commander that we're talking about here. Yeah. Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. Yeah. Was. Okay, I'm just going to put his full name in here so people don't get confused. What's his middle name? Vipsanius. V-I-P-S-A-N-I-U-S. Vipsanius Agrippa. Okay. Okay. And definitely, I mean, I mean, a person could ar- argue that it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, they, they and, and, and I sort of dismiss the idea that this is referring to Cleopatra because I don't think she's really forecasting any devices. That is, She's not part really of this planning. I mean, she's more a hindrance to Octavian than anything. Oddly, you know, she would think it, it, it's almost as if she she had actually planned to lose this battle or something. Um, pardon me, I'm getting backwards because she's with not not Cleopatra's with Anthony, right? right? Anthony. Okay. So and she ends up being a hindrance. So yeah. So it'd have to be. That's why we were thinking maybe that they was. Antony and Cleopatra. I think right. that's what, right. That's what we were doing. Okay. Correct. So, so, so it can't be Antony and Cleopatra, uh, forecasting their devices against Octavian. Okay. It has to be that they has to refer to two people. It can't refer, or at least two people. It can't just refer to Octavian. And that was where I think we were having the problem, if I remember down correctly. I think I got that straight in my head. Okay, so it's going to be Octavian and Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. Correct. That forecast their devices against Antony. And then it's going to refer to another they, that is they that feed of the portion of Egypt's meat, right? And that's why I was having a hard time saying, well, there's a they, there's another they, they can't be the same they, right, based upon... I mean, we are looking at the idea that maybe that they could have been the army, but but I, I think this makes more sense. Okay, so yeah, so I think now we got that straight. I think that that helps. And any comments on that? And and then we have we have uh, the Pantheon, and again, it's built by who? Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. So he builds it himself. He is the one that gives the instruction and oversees the original building of the Pantheon. Okay, I thought it was older than that. No, because when when you look at the history, he improved several portions of Rome. This was a position that many of the older, more ruling class Roman families would not normally take upon themselves. But he took the position he was known in Rome at that time as being someone that took on these projects and was well respected for them. Okay. So here he is, Octavian's brother-in-law and a military lieutenant, military commander, taking this position, builds the original Pantheon. Now, the name Marcus, of course, dedicated to Mars, the Roman god of war. Mm-hmm. And that was a very popular Roman name. Mm-hmm. His family name, Vipsanius, meaning problem solver, mm-hmm. and then Agrippa, meaning the wild horse. Mm-hmm. So 
it's it, it was also interesting to me that Herod Agrippa I and Herod Agrippa II had changed their name to accept Agrippa as to honor Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. Okay. So the Her- Herod Agrippa is right. honoring Marcus. Okay. Yeah, and I think maybe what I did is I, I, you know, we often get the Parthenon and the Pantheon mixed up, and I somehow conflated the age of the Pantheon to the age of of the Parthenon. You know, that's probably what happened in my head, because that's quite a bit earlier. Right. And okay. So yeah. So so the Pantheon. Uh, um, and I always think of it as a very ugly building. I'm not sure. <laughs> why but uh yeah so so with this uh this pantheon it just says i'm just looking at wikipedia here it says it's commissioned by marcus agrippa during the reign of augustus so 27 bc to 14 a.d so obviously this is going to be later after the battle of actium that he's going to be the one um and, and it says, though, then after that, it was burnt down and the present building was ordered by the Emperor Hadrian and probably dedicated in A.D. 126. Right. Which is interesting. So its date of construction is uncertain because Hadrian chose not to inscribe the new temple, but rather to retain the inscription of Agrippa's older temple. So they have. Um, so so in 126, which is kind of an interesting symbol. So the building is round in plan, except for the protocol with large granite Corinthian columns, eight in the first rank and two groups of four behind under a pediment. Rectangular vestibule links the porch to the rotunda, which is up under a coffered concrete dome with a central opening oculus to the sky. Almost 2,000 years after it was built, the Pantheon's dome is still the world's largest re- unreinforced concrete dome. The height of the occultus and the diameter of the interior circle are the same, 43 meters. Now, so in the context here, now it says they're going to forecast these devices from the strongholds, even for a time. Now, so we here we have the Pantheon. Uh, now, it's not it's not going to be, you know, built till after the Battle of Actium sometime. But can it refer to that because it's it's built during that period? Possible. Yeah, I wonder if, yeah. So just, it ends up symbolizing that, that false religious system, the pantheon. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's interesting then again. Okay, now when we look then at, so part of this thing is when we're looking at the present truth application, we have, um, we, we have November 9th, 1989, the Battle of Actium. And it says, uh, they shall forecast they, now we're saying that's Octavian and Marcus Agrippa, shall forecast devices against Antony. So that's historically what happens. How would we specifically uh, refer to that? Is this referring to the period prior to 1989? Is that is that how we would understand that? So what we would have then, if that's the case, uh, we would just simply have to say that this parallels the papacy and well maybe I'll even be more specific John Paul II and Reagan and we'll just say the USSR instead of naming people but what do we think of that is that that then makes sense so Octavian representing John Paul II and Agrippa representing Reagan the military power could be. Okay. Okay. Now we have, um, yea, they, Anthony's army that feed of the portion of his Egypt's meat, uh, shall destroy him. Now, how would we apply this? So if we're going to look at Anthony's army, um, that feed of the portion of, so Egypt, Egypt represents here, we, we have Egypt, which is the king of the south. Right. So we're going to have to say that's the USSR in this context. Um, now they feed up the portion of his meat in this history. It's that the, the king of the South's army is dependent upon Egypt for grain. 
as well as, you know, and probably what we could say, Rome is dependent upon, and me and Stephen had this discussion. So I'm just saying in the Battle of Actium, you have the fact that uh, Antony and Cleopatra are in Actium and they're dependent upon the supply of grain to come from Egypt. That supply of grain is cut off. And that's why they actually go into the battle, into to the maritime battle, because they didn't actually weren't looking for a maritime battle. They were they were wanting um, Octavian's army to come to land. But instead, Octavian, through Agrippa's advice, waited. They basically waited out. They, they took the supply of grain, Antony's army starving. And that's why they actually go into this battle. On, on the sea. But okay. here's here's another point to consider. Okay. Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, for almost seven years with Octavian, had to fight two different groups that were looking to cut off the grain shipments to Rome. And those two different groups, one was led by Sextus Pompey. So you're you're dealing with Sextus Pompeius Magnus Pius, who was the son of Pompey the Great, and Antony. So you have you have this this threat to the grain for Rome coming from one party that had been at for a while very close to Julius Caesar, and another that had been Octavian's right hand, which was Antony. Okay, I'm just going to put here. I'm going to. So if we say they defeated the portion of his Egypt's feet, that that is Rome was dependent upon Egypt for grain, which is Stephen's point, which was originally my point, and Stephen argued against it, and then he argued for it, and I was arguing against it. But I think this just makes sense then. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Uh, Because Rome is going to destroy Antony. And and the point here has to do with this grain, because the question was why is it, it bringing up this part? Um, you know, the idea that that Rome is dependent upon Egypt for grain. And, and part of it has to do with the fact that, you know, the grain is cut off to Antony's army. But it's also being cut off to Rome in general from at least parts of Rome. Because when they're cutting off the grain, they're obviously taking the grain. So Rome is dependent upon Egypt for grain. Um, but they're going to destroy him, that is, the king of the south, and in this case, Antony commits suicide August 1st, 30 BC in Egypt. And then Octavian's army shall overflow. You know, we would have to put this as in 30 BC, which we're going to say then is the Sunday law. Now, then it says many shall fall down slain. Antony's army and navy would be defeated. I mean, I think this is just the end of Egypt in general. Egypt is conquered <coughs> by Rome. <coughs> That's all that really refers to. And, uh, that shouldn't be black. That should be, or it should be colored. It should be black. There we go. I was trying to bold it. That's what I was trying to do. There we go. Okay. So that, that gives us um, the historical application a bit better. How would we then apply that in a present truth application? So the, in the present. So, uh, so can, in what way would the Soviet Union. So, so we'd have to change this. It's not Antony's army. So we would have to say that they that feed of the portion of Egypt's meat, um, that would just be Rome. Right. That feed of the portion of Egypt's meat, um, shall destroy him. And so in this case, we would have to try to understand what this means in a present truth sense. So but it, let's just try this. Let's try this. Not let's try this. Okay, Rome. Papacy. Is that what Rome refers to in this context? Generally, that's what we've been doing. Egypt. So if we made that as a present truth application, how could we say that the papacy feeds on the portion of the USSR's meat? What would that be referring to? You know, in, in a spiritual sense, not a literal sense. We're not going to be talking about, you know, the grain that's grown in Russia or anything like that, or Poland or 
aren't they seeking for the same kind of control that Russia has had over their population? Well, see, I, I wouldn't put the same kind of control. I think that this more has to do with really the fact is that the papacy is socialist, just like the Soviet Union is. The papacy is not a supporter of capitalism. Correct. Right. So I mean, that is, they're feeding on the same, the same ideology. Isn't that? I was going to say doctrines. I don't. I, I was going to say doctrines. Yeah, well, well, doctrines. You know, I mean, they have some different doctrines. I mean, we could say, you know, one is atheistic. And, you know, we could look at the contrast between them because there is a lot of things that are not the same about the Soviet Union and the papacy in in their doctrines. But there is a basic underlying idea of socialism and, and communism that actuates both. So the and papacy feeding on the portion that portion of the Soviet Union's meat, but it's going to destroy him. And this is one of the things that seems almost ironic in some ways, because uh, the papacy could have supported the Soviet Union in its um, economic goals, right? And, and you still see that today. The papacy really supports the UN in its economic goals, but the papacy is not atheistic like the UN. You, you understand what I'm saying? Obviously, they're, they're opposed to the true God, but, but they have a different, a different agenda. They both want to control the world, but under a different, a different ideology, but both have a similar ide ideology. The papacy really believes in the government control of the economy, a state controlled economy. And this would then make sense in the present truth application to understand why, why the papacy sought to conquer the Soviet Union. Because basically they were fighting over that same territory. Um, this is one of the things that Tess got right when she started addressing why John Paul II was seeking to conquer uh, Russia or the Soviet Union. So I think that this is, um, I think this makes sense why it's, why it's mentioned here. And so uh, this committing of suicide here, we can put uh, December 25th, 1991. And then we mark 9-11 as the parallel to the Sunday law. And then here, okay, how does that look? Or are we going to want to have where Egypt is conquered by Rome? Yeah, I think we have to put that there. I think we have to put that as 9-11. All right. But how do we how do we apply this with the many that fall down slain? Because we're not we're not approaching the many or the fallen down. OK, well, these would be um, I mean, these are obviously uh, addressing the, the fall of the Soviet Union. So we have all of these countries that were part of the Soviet Union. They now are not connected directly to the Soviet Union. They are going to be connected to the UN, though. So, I mean, we, we could say, well, this applies to individuals. But I would think that this applies to the nations that are affected historically. Because what's going to happen with the fall of Egypt? It's going to be a strengthening of the Roman Empire, right? Well, originally the Roman Republic, which is going to become the first Roman, uh, well, imperial Rome, right? Okay. So Rome becomes this universal kingdom. So maybe, maybe the UN conquered by the papacy is not the best way to look at this. Okay. So if we're going to say many in this is, we'll say, I know this is long. Right, reference to the parts of Rome. I don't know what what's the better word than parts. What do they call the parts of Rome? Segments. No, the they have a name for the different um, areas uh, of of Rome. They, they they divide Rome in what way? What what are the the hills? No, no, not the city of Rome. But I'm talking about the empire. Oh. Right. What, what do they call the? You know, they don't have. Is it provinces? Yes. Okay. So the provinces of Rome shall fall down slain. So this falling down, 
5307. So what would this refer to? So it, uh, to fall in a great variety of applications, intransitively or causatively, literally or figuratively, be accepted, cast down, cease, die, divided, overwhelm, perish, presented, rot, slay, smite. It has a lot of different, different, I, I like the word divided. I think that applies quite well. Okay. Now I have an odd question for you. Okay. When we're, when we're addressing with this about they feed on the portion of his meat. Yeah. Okay. Your reference is to Hebrew six, nine or five, eight. Right. Which we looked at. It means, um, like a, a delicacy or like, um, right. Something like that. Dainty or. Okay, but your dyslexia oh. kicked in. Your dyslexia kicked in a little bit because it's six, five, nine, or eight. Oh, six, five, nine, eight. Okay. Okay. And why is it in in this portion? Daniel, being the careful writer that he is, why did he use a Persian word versus a Hebrew word? Well, it's just a, a Persian loan loan word word. Probably because there is no Hebrew word that would uh, give that meaning. It's intriguing because the the word itself is path bag. Yeah. And only in Daniel is that word used. Yeah. Okay. And well, I'm just, that's that's why I'm I'm asking. I mean. Yeah, because Daniel's going to use it. He's writing the book of Daniel. He's going to be using it in the Aramaic sections as well, right? Sometimes translated as meat, sometimes as portion. It's it's used mostly in Daniel chapter 1, and then in Daniel chapter 11 just uh, twice in, well, yeah, they're just, yeah, they're using it as portion of his meat. So So I think it's actually... Yeah, it's it's one word and it's translated with two words. So it's only once in Daniel eleven twenty six. But it, I mean, it makes sense that he's going to use this word that he's familiar with, uh, especially since it describes something. So the idea of a portion of his meat, this dainty, uh, why would he be choosing that word? Well, OK, when I'm asking this question, mm-hmm. I'm also having to to wonder if there isn't a reason, I mean, was this, since this was rejected in a large, in a large portion by Daniel, especially in Daniel one five, wasn't it? Was yeah. this, meat, was this meat that was being offered to the gods? Yeah. Yeah. So the idea here then is that this is a, um, and, and that would fit in with our interpretation is this is this ideology. Right. Okay. Right. Because so if we're going to look at at, at this when we deal with the portion of his U.S.'s or his meat, if if we're going to look at this and the present application, this would refer to the we use the word communism or maybe even Marxist ideology would work as well. Um, so that is the papacy. And the USSR both support, we'll say, Mark Marxist. Okay, that makes sense. They both are Marxist. Agreed. Okay, and and you know, the Soviet Union does commit suicide. We can agree with that, right? In a manner of speaking, yeah. I mean, they aren't like literally conquered by some army that comes in and and destroys them, right? I mean, obviously, there's the pressure. Anthony feels the pressure, too. That's why he commits suicide, right? But but you also have, you know, just simply the idea that the Soviet Union causes its own demise, you know, on December 25th, 1991. So we have here Octavian's army. That's going to be papacies. Army, and that army is USA. So now the many, so this, now we say it's a reference to the provinces of Rome, if that's a suggestion. Um, 
And then I would just put this to the countries of the UN. That's just a guess, right? Now, fall down. Now, the word fall down means divisions. Okay. And then the word slain, 4291, 2491, uh, halal, means to be pierced or fatally wounded, slain. It could also be defiled or profaned by divorce. That would be the adjective. It says the noun would be pierced, fatally wounded, slain. So here it's used as a noun. Oh, it's kind of interesting. Because right. because this word, if you look at it, a halal, what is that word? You, you, everybody knows this word. At least you should. Halal? Halal. I'm familiar with that pronunciation dealing with the Islamic way of slaughtering meat. Yeah. That's what it, that's what the word means. It means slaughtered. Okay. <laughs> so you can see the relationship between this word slain right, uh, or pierced, and the idea, uh, you know, that it's, it's killed, right? So it's just, that's just, it's based on the same word. Okay. <clears throat> so they're going to fall down halal. Okay, I'm just going to look at this here now. And it's kind of kind of weird in the Hebrew with this verse, you know, because they have the word many at the end of the verse, right? So it's just, it's going to have... Fall down, slain, many. Instead of many, fall down, slain. It does it in the opposite order. And so it's going to be in the call form, perfect, complete tense, plural, third perfect person. So fall down, the slain, many, literally. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any thoughts on that? So if we're going to have um, many shall fall down, slain. Exactly, you know, who are the many? No, is this the countries of the UN that were once part of the USR, USSR? Okay, so what are, what are the countries of the USSR that end up breaking off from the Soviet Union? Generally speaking, what, what are they? One is Poland, ain't it? Correct. And another one is the UK, ain't it? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not the UK. Um, okay. So when you have the dissolution of the Soviet Union, you're going to have all of these different countries that are going to be, right? So obviously you got like things like Poland. So you got, um, uh, Western Germany, wouldn't it? Western Germany? E East Germany. East Germany. I'm sorry. So obviously you got East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Albania. They're going to be what they call the Eastern Bloc now, right? They're going to be, and some, some were aligned and then later on became independent, like Albania in 1960 and Yugoslavia in 1948. Well, can I ask a question? Yeah, of if, course. If, if the UK is not part of that, what, what is the, why are they having so much? Okay. Yeah, I don't What's your question? I was saying if the UK is not part of that, why is Russia trying to destroy it? The UK? Yeah, that, that part that they in, they fighting over now. Ukrainian, Ukraine, you mean? Yeah, you're Ukrainian. Oh, you're calling Ukraine the UK? Yeah, that's what I was calling it. I'm sorry. Yeah, don't call it the UK. <laughs> Ukrainian, and uh, yeah, yeah, because <clears throat> because it has a lot of different territories that it's going to lose, right? You got the Baltic republics. I'm just trying to look at all the different countries. I don't, I can't find a good list of all the countries, but you have some Islamic countries, right, as well. So Afghanistan, that was part of the Soviet Union, right? But they didn't want to yield it. Yeah, they. They really didn't want to yield it. Remember, that's why mm -hmm. USSR went to war with Afghanistan, because they wanted Afghanistan as part of the Iron Curtain, and, and the Afghanis would not accede to that. Yeah, so, so and that's going to start in 1979, right? So that Correct. war. 
um, because we looked into that in detail. So, uh, but they had lots of other places. So you're going to have, um, a lot of pe- a lot of different places like Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Azerbaijan, Na- Nakishavan, Gag, or ASSR. I don't know what that place is. Uh, Georgia, uh, Uzbekistan, Maldi- no, Moldavian, U- Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Turkmen, Armenian. Now, some of these are parts of these other areas, right? Like, like they're areas within different areas. There's Crimea. And some of these places I've never heard of. Such as? Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, AO. Kar- Karakalpak. South Otessian. So in all, so what ends up happening in 1989 is you're going to have a string of all kinds of sovereignties and so forth that, that occur, right? Um, starting in, in 88, actually, where people are going to be proclaiming sovereignty, where their independence is going to be occur in, in, in the early 1990s. And, um, yeah, so there's just a list there. So there's, you know, a whole area that, that the Soviet Union loses. So, so anyway, there's just, I mean, I don't know all, all of the parts that became different countries and I don't know what all the different areas are. So let me see if I can just maybe. Okay. So the republics of the Soviet Union, I got a list here now, a map. Okay. So this, this will help a little bit. So you're going to see all these different uh, territories down in the bottom in this sort of orange color and purple and brown and some yellow. These are uh, in this area. Um, you're going to see it's called Kazakh SSR, Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic, right? You got the Soviet, the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic. This is the part that we call Russia though it lost some of this territory, I believe. And we can see here in this, uh, Poland is part of this, I think, because Poland is right down here. So you got the Ukraine. Man, my geography is terrible. So where's Poland in this? Is that down? Okay. Poland technically is to the west of the Ukraine. Yes, yeah, so that would be over here. So it it's not part of the Soviet Union. It was then. part of the Soviet bloc, but not part of the Soviet okay. Union. Okay, okay. So that then makes sense. So that's the problem that I'm having. So it's part of the Soviet bloc, but not part of the Soviet Union. Now, Ukraine is part of the Soviet Union. Correct. <laughs> Because it's the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. You got Moldavia, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkmen. Turkmenistan. Uz- yeah, and then Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kakistan. Right. So you got, you got some of these which later, well, these end up being the ones at the bottom here. I guess that's as big as that little go. Tajikistan, Tajik, SSSR, Kurd, Kurds. So anyway, you got all these different places. So, so some of these, the point that I'm trying to make is some of these are what we would now call Islamic countries, right? Correct. Okay. And, um, so I'm just wondering if there is a reference then with this halal, right? So I know that's, it may be a bit of a leap. <clears throat> but could we could we look at these that many that are going to fall down slain that these are countries that are then going to be that the Soviet Union is going to lose and and they I don't know if they're they're going to become halal which doesn't I mean they become Islamic instead of part of the Soviet Union 
but that, I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe there's some way in which it does that I can't. You know, I could be making too much out of the word halal. So just in the context here, so when we're putting it into the present truth, so we have this reference to the provinces of Rome, the countries of the UN is how we're, we're applying that. But the provinces of Rome, or the many, would be these nations. And I'm not sure how much Rome expands, you know, specifically, and where they expand. But, I mean, they are going to conquer Egypt, and that would in, increase their territory in the south. So I'm not sure how big Rome gets, what. But um, so maybe we should say that uh, this reference uh, is the many is countries conquered by Rome. And this is uh, countries conquered by, now I say countries of the UN, right? So so maybe this is, now of course that, so this many is referring to the countries conquered by Rome. And in our sense, the countries of the USSR conquered by the papacy in some way. Right. But also, we could say here, could we say that this is, would this make any sense? Countries conquered by Islam or the papacy, just because of halal. And this, this falling down is, uh, we can say it's divided up. I don't know. Does that make sense? I mean, this is always open for revision, you know, correcting things later on. So what we have is we have the fall of the Soviet Union. In the fall of the Soviet Union, we have countries that are going to be conquered by the papacy, but also countries that are going to be conquered by Islam. So, I mean, technically, we know uh, Poland is not part of the Soviet Union, but it's going to be in Poland where we have... Basically, so I, I don't understand that. You know, I, I, when I always thought Soviet bloc countries were part of the Soviet Union, so I guess you learn something new every day. I always thought Poland was part of the Soviet Union, but I guess it's not. So how does what happens in Poland lead to the fall of the Soviet Union? All right. Yeah. Think, so educate. Think of the Soviet bloc countries basically is being a large dividing curtain the situation okay. the situation was that when poland <clears throat> under lech walesa and the solidarity movement mm -hmm. started to open up what had been going on within their boundaries it was revealing a lot of issues that had been happening because the central planning that the socialist countries had been doing was shown as being a failure. That had been assumed for a long time, but the unrest that had been occurring in the countries had never really been openly addressed. Okay. So didn't it, didn't it also have something to do with the unions? Well, <clears throat> that's part of the unrest. Yes. Because what Valenza did is he made it so that the people that were doing the work were to be compensated more for their labor. And instead of the oligarchs, the overseers, receiving so much benefit, the people began receiving more benefit. Okay. Now, these other countries that we're looking at here, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, all of these <clears throat> for many years had been portions of the old Russian Empire. Just like mm -hmm. this with the Ukraine, that was a portion of the old Russian Empire. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at the map that you had up and you yeah. recognize that the Ukraine was seen as being the breadbasket, the grain supplier of the entire Russian area. Mm -hmm. This little area of yellow was yeah. what provided the food for everything else. 
Yeah, it's like Alberta and Saskatchewan. It's the same sort of um, uh, landscape and everything. It's got the steps and uh, the prairies and all that stuff. Okay. Now, <clears throat> right now, Putin wants the control of the Ukraine because of what the Ukraine has in natural resources and what the Ukraine has been growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they also don't want the Ukraine to be joined with NATO. Correct. Now, that's it's interesting because when you're looking at this map, the acronym of NATO stands for what? Well, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Correct. Where does the Ukraine border on the Atlantic? Um, well, it doesn't. Exactly. Yeah. It, and, and the United States, from what I understand, has been working, um, militarily. I mean, they're really the cause of this war between Russia and the Ukraine. Right. Because Russia was extremely threatened by what was happening. So, um, so it's not, it's not like Russia just came in and decided they wanted to conquer the Ukraine. It, they were being threatened. So, and, and they saw, they see Ukraine as a natural part of Russia. Right. At least parts of it. They might disagree with, you know, exactly where that border should be. But, but anyway, that's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I know a little bit about the history of it. I'm definitely not an expert. By any stretch, I know that what's presented in the media is is a distortion of reality. So, so when the curtain began to be withdrawn from Poland, from East Germany, mm -hmm. from the Slovaks, from the Czechs, from Romania, mm -hmm. it was giving more light on the real mess that had been occurring within the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So, in 1989, when the wall fell in East Germany, mm -hmm. the cracks of what had been occurring within Russia began to be revealed. Mm -hmm. Now, as you look at this situation where you're looking at Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, all of this, it is along those borders that you're going to find Afghanistan and you're going to find Pakistan and India. Yeah. yeah and I think it's Kyrgyzstan uh, where a friend of mine, uh, Jason Singer Smith, was uh, attacked by Islamic terrorists when he's climbing the mountain. So, okay. Interesting story. I'm pretty sure, I know it was one of the stands, I know it wasn't uh, it could. I don't think it was Kazakhstan. Pretty sure it, it started with K, and it was one of the stands. So <clears throat> and the one I never know that remember the name. I think that's Kyrgyzstan. But anyway, could have been another place. So anyway, that that makes that makes sense then. So so with the fall of the Soviet Union, obviously the Soviet bloc countries. There is no Soviet Union, so they can't be Soviet bloc countries. Right. And, and each of them are going to have a different sort of, because uh, um, they already exist as different countries. They don't end up, you know, seceding from the Soviet Union. Uh, but then you have all of these other countries, and these are the many, right? So I'm saying that these are the many that fall down slain. Now, we would say, well, the Soviet Union is dissolved, and we say they fall down slain. Well, obviously, they still exist, right? But now they're no longer part of Egypt or the King of the South. And some of them weren't even part of the King of the South. All I'm saying is that, that the parallel historically would be what happens when Rome conquers Egypt um, – that this is going to lead to other places becoming part of, I don't want to do that. Do this here. So 
they're going to become part of Rome, right? Right. But I don't I don't know about all of the different countries and exactly what happens. So how does the Roman Empire grow through time? So you got imperial Rome is, is technically from 31 BC to 476, according to this history page I'm looking on right now. They have the Republic of Rome from 510 to 31. So, so this is the start of imperial, right? The Battle of Actium, even though technically, I'm not sure when exactly what year he becomes Augustus Caesar because he's Octavian. So I'm not, I'd have to look that up. Okay, so I'm just looking at, yeah, so I know by in the first century, it's going to expand quite a bit, first century AD. I'm just trying to find a good map. Okay, well, here's here's something that's good that I can show you. Okay, so it's, I can blow this up probably, that'll be better. So there we can see Rome, that's going to be 338 BC, so it's a little tiny place there on that peninsula. And 279 BC, 212 BC, and this is 86 BC. So you can see it doesn't have Egypt, it's Carthage, and then it's going to in 9 AD. So, okay, so its expansion is really going to happen after it becomes Imperial Rome. So that was what I was not sure about. It'd be nice if they had one in between 86 BC and here, because that's quite a lot of area. And I know that a lot of this area is going to be conquered by uh, Julius Caesar and others. And then they're going to have part of, in 116 AD, uh, the Parthians, right? So they're going to end up with a lot of Persia. And then they're going to lose a lot of that territory by 269. The secession of the Gallic Empire, that's all this area up here. And Palmyria, this part of the Persian Empire. That makes sense to people? Is that helpful? And then under Constantine, he's going to reunite the empire, which is interesting. But then, then you're going to get the loss of the West to the Germanic kingdoms. And then Justinian recon, re, it has, does a reconquest of the West, at least parts of it and losses to Avars and Persia. So you can see the kingdom changing over time, 740, 754. Losses to the Arabs and the Lombards. And then 812, the maximum the re renovation of Imperial Rome by Charlemagne. So you can see what ends up happening with the Roman Empire under Charlemagne. And then uh, the end of Western Empire, losses to Bulgars and Arabs. Revival of the West, re re revanche of the East, uh, expansion into Poland, right? So just through through time, it's going to be changing what we call Rome. 1452, the end, conquest by the Turks, right? So as far as an empire is concerned, um, the Turks end up basically redu reducing them to almost nothing. Okay, does that help? And does that help us understand that first, that that makes sense? Yeah, yeah it helps. Okay. Yeah. Cause then I, I, I think we can, we can take the position that with the Battle of Actium, which it's going to talk about here, um, that's going to be an expansion of this power. And that parallels something in our history, which we would equate with the time of the end and what we see happening here uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union. Okay. So I think that makes perfect sense now, that the historical application makes sense and the present truth application makes sense. There's maybe some details that could be refined. Any further thoughts on that? I mean, the only thing, you know, we could say that, well, this, this stirring up that occurs, it's obviously going to be prior to November 9th, and, and there's going to be that proxy war in Afghanistan that's probably being referred to to some degree. But also what's happening with, uh, you know, John Paul II and, and Reagan. So there's probably some, some of these Hebrew numbers might give us some time spans in the present truth application. Okay. You satisfied for today? We've got a couple minutes left, but.
Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We just ask for your continued uh, presence throughout this day, that your angels can watch over each person searching for truth and our loved ones, and uh, that we can be an influence for good. Help us to continue to study these things, to understand them, and thank you for how you have clarified so many things for us this morning. We ask for your care throughout this week in our personal study and in our group studies. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.